it's episode five. Right? Yeah. Episode five of Screen Preach. And uh, as usual, I'm your host, Ben Morganti. Ben Morganti. Ben Morgant. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, episode five, I, f- I feel like is that's, that's gotta be all there is to an intro, right? Welcome back, you know, all that stuff, okay, uh, what, what is going on this week, and there, wait, Wait for it. Wait. Stick stick with it. Good. Okay. Just checking my my audio, making sure it's uh, not gonna stop. Like it usually does. So what's new? I'm still in this quarantine thing. I mean, I gotta check that, but isn't two weeks up? Pretty sure two weeks is up. Don't think it matters. I'm in LA. It was a two-week thing. Everything's closed and whatever, but I'm pretty sure it's extended. I'm not a hundred. Definitely not over yet. It's definitely not over yet. What? You're that tired, donut? Huh? It's all you do is sleep. Um. I don't know. I don't know. What else is new? Stabbed myself in the arm this week while I was cooking. You know, given everything that's going on, I bet that that statistic is a little bit higher. Everybody's so bored. There's people who are out there who've never cooked before in their life, and they're cooking. I bet like 20% of the hospital visits are young people who stab themselves because they don't know how to fucking do shit in the kitchen. Look, it was stupid, okay? I, I took the knife and I went this way. And you never go this way because it's like towards you. You go that way and that's common sense. But I just, you know, it never happened before in my life. So now I definitely learned the lesson. <laughs> now I definitely won't cut towards me. But yeah, that was... uh. That was pretty scary at first. When it first went in there, I thought it, like, went in there. Like, I was, like, I was holding it like it was a fucking, I I couldn't believe, I thought I was going to go to the fucking hospital and, or have to go to the hospital in this, and there was no way that that was going to be good. But we're, we're, we're still here. Screen Preach episode five. We're still here. I didn't have to go to the hospital, you know. And I didn't, uh, I stitched it all up myself and everything, so. It's weird when you see, like, flesh, like, your own flesh, like, cut, like, like you would cut chicken or something. It's fucking, I got a little lightheaded, but, yeah, it's, it's weird. Definitely won't be, uh, making that mistake again. What else we got? This week I'm gonna, um... I'm going to talk about Just Mercy. It's tough right now. I have to, uh, I have to watch stuff at home specifically. So it's, it's good that they're releasing a lot of stuff, you know, early uh, streaming. And so I was able to get like Just Mercy and like Birds of Prey and the gentlemen are all out earlier. But that's what I'm working with because I can't go to the theaters and see anything new. I- I'll probably do a few episodes coming up that are about older movies. Um, just because I'm running out of new stuff. And that's fine. People have said they wanted me to do that, so I- I'll, do- I'll probably do that. Um, but Just Mercy was 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 good to have that. So that's what I'll be talking about today. That was, was a good one. Um, before we get into that, as usual... Just because I know everybody's dealing with, like, unbelievable boredom. I am too. Um, 
So there's a couple things I'd recommend watching. Ozark season three came back, and I haven't. I'm halfway through the season, so I, I mean I won't talk about it. I won't like spoil anything or whatever. But it's it's it goes how you would expect it to go in the beginning, and then it like there's like a twist, and then it's like okay now it's been kicked in the high gear, and there's <laughs> there's no turning back and. It, it's what you would want from the third season. And Laura Linney is really like the state the spotlight is on her this season. Like it really her performance is, is a lot of what carries this season and seeing her character arc is I think what, what I expected at the end of season two. So it's going how I thought it would. I would recommend watching it. If you haven't watched it at all yet, you need to get on board. It's like it's like Netflix's Breaking Bad is how I would pitch it to someone who hasn't seen it yet. So it's worth definitely worth looking at. And you'll be hooked. Don't worry about it. You know, you watch a few, you'll be hooked. And season three is out now. So there's that. There's also uh everybody's talking about this Tiger King on Netflix. I haven't seen it yet, but everybody's raving about it, so it's something that you can do. It's another thing you can watch. Also, a lot of comedians came out with some good specials. Uh, Burt Kreischer, Tom Segura. So, again, these are all Netflix things. You can These are things for you to watch while you're in isolation. Um, I, I'm looking forward to Chris D'Elia's special. comes out on April 14th. Hopefully by April 14th, things are progressing past staying in this room most of my week, you know? Um, uh, but let's, as usual, let's talk about news, some, some interesting stuff this week. What do we got? What do we got? Here's a quick one. Deadpool creator says Josh Brolin wants to keep playing Cable in the MCU despite his Thanos role. Now this could work. It's one thing if like you wanted Ryan Reynolds. Oh, that's a bad example. Let's see. If you wanted like Hugh Jackman to play another character in the MCU it would be like two... No, we'd be like, no, that's Wolverine. We know him as Wolverine. That doesn't work for us. Here, My point is this. This works because Josh Brolin physically was has not been in the MCU yet. Like his appearance. He played the voice of Thanos. He plays Cable physically in the Deadpool films. So it does work. You want He, he can keep playing. I think that's a good idea. And, and honestly, he was great as Cable. I wouldn't want anyone else. Um, they can't, like, recast that. Like, he's been Cable in two... No, one film, but if they want to go the direction they want to go, which I think leads into, like, a, te- a like Deadpool's team, X-Force team or whatever, Cable's part of that, and you need Josh Brolin. And since Thanos is dead, he's motherfucking dead. Spoilers for anyone who's been living under a fucking rock. He's dead. Um, it works. You, it's not like they're going to cross paths. And even if they did, it still might work. Because <laughs> like I said, he's, it's only the voice so of Thanos. I'm down with that. I am down with that. Then I saw that this is another... Th- um, Ryan Reynolds is in negotiations to star in Dragon's Lair for Netflix. Dragon's Lair, I guess, is an it's an, like an old arcade game, and they're like adapting it for Netflix. And Ryan Reynolds is in talk to star in it. Ryan Reynolds probably has the best track record of anybody trying to do a video game adaptation. He did the uh, Detective Pikachu, and I know that that was like a whatever, like it was an okay movie, but it was better than literally all the other <laughs> video game adaptations. So it is the best video game <laughs> adaptation <laughs> so far. So it looks like he uh, he's in talks for another one, video game um, adaptation, Dragon's Lair. 
And we got this. Doctor Strange. This is this is good. I like to hear this stuff because it's hopeful. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Man is still on track to begin production in June. Hopefully it stays on track to begin production in June. But I like to hear that. I like to hear that we're still trying to keep, you know, keep working. I'm sh <laughs> Let me tell you, writers, screenwriters are... They're busy right now. <laughs> they don't need to leave to do their work. So there's a lot of... I, I, I'm, it, I like to think about the fact that right now some really masterful films are being written right now. While this is all going on, films are being made by writers at home that we're all going to get to enjoy when this is all over. Uh, it's like the same thing with like music. Like right now, some albums are being cooked up. Like OD hard. Um, what else? Fantastic Beast 3 star Dan Fogler says the film is very similar to the feel of the first movie and le and this one leads to a massive war. Uh, cool. I hope it feels more like the first movie because the first movie was good. The second movie was like, what happened? If you're, if you're like a big Harry Potter fan, you enjoyed both of them anyway, but you're, you're not blind to see how flawed the second one was. Um, so I hope the third one feels more like the first one, because that would mean it's already a little better. The fact that it says it leads to a massive war, they're still focusing on the whole first wizarding war between Dumbledore and Grindelwald. And that's like so odd. It's just odd that, that that it took that direction. Like, that's what we're focusing on all of a sudden. But they're called Fantastic Beasts. They're, it's about Newt. And, and, and so it needs to really focus more on that. If you wanted to do this, she should have done this with that being the focal point. Like, it should have been a Dumbledore-centered series. Like, with Jude Law playing Dumbledore, which is cool. Like... But they, she like it's like combining two stories together, making Newt a part of it in a way that it's never been mentioned in the Harry Potter films or books that like Newt was like a huge part of that war, and now he is, and and all the little other surprises she's throwing at us that it's like, okay, I understand you want to like appease fans, but it's like. Continuity is important, too. People, I mean, fans have grown really strict about about continuity. I think that, that Marvel has, has made us more aware of continuity. We want things to connect if it's meant to connect. So, like, when we see something poorly connected... Like some of the DC films or or this, it's it. It's a uh, difficult, difficult for us to accept something that's flawed. In terms of continuity, I'm still uh, still looking forward to it. I I like that world, so. I'm not gonna not. Not watch. MGM in exclusive talks for hot Andy Ware sci-fi novel Project Hail Mary. Ryan Gosling attached to star and produce. Ryan Gosling is, is becoming a sci-fi star. I mean, between Blade Runner, First Man. I mean, that's not, First Man is not sci-fi. It's bio biographical, but still, it's like space and shit. <laughs> so this is all right. First of all, Andy Ware he is the author author of the the Martian novel, and as we know, the Martian was an awesome fucking movie. Matt Damon. So this is like his. This is another one of his. It's called Project Hail Mary, and I guess Ryan Gosling is in talks to star. It's that's that's cool. that's definitely something to look forward to. Um, 
let's see what they what did they say right here. The, the book is described as a solitary tale of an astronaut on a spaceship who is tasked with saving the planet there are some very clever twists that i won't give away here but it but is consistent with the engine wow look at that i got caught up with a fucking i can't believe while this is recording i can't pronounce a word Ingenu ingenuity 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 right with the ingenuity <laughs> uh, that made the martian a thrilling ride god damn it that is so fucking fucked like how can i be a writer and i don't know some i can't whatever gosling is attached to play the astronaut okay this is cool okay that's great we're gonna move on because i don't know what the fuck happened there that is already that is just already ruined the whole fucking episode. It's all over. Fucking done. Might as well just, you know, stop. Right here. Solar Opposites trailer. Okay, you guys gotta check this out. It's from uh, one of the creators of Rick and Morty, so it's kind of in like in that world. You know, it's like similar. It's their newest. It's his, It's a new comedy sci-fi animated show. For, for, uh, for all you Rick and Morty fans out there, which is pretty much everybody. If you're not a Rick and Morty fan, you should be. It's fucking great. I don't know what happened with that, by the way. You know, if you look on IMDb, it's like there's supposed to be more episodes of season four of Rick and Morty. It's it stopped in December, and there's been no word since. There's no when's it coming back? Where's the rest of the the season? Sick of waiting for it. They said they're doing like. They said they're they're gonna be pumping out, like. Season a season a year now I think instead of it's been like two year waits in between, um. But the fact that they split up this season and now we're waiting and we have no word of when it comes back is like a little annoying. Usually when they take that holiday break or whatever. Some shows. There's, I mean, there's more, there's at least word of when it comes back. Otherwise, it might as well just be season five when it comes back. But solar opposites, like polar opposites, which is, I, I like the play on words. Yeah, watch that trailer. You know, if I had better technology and shit, I would play it right now and it would also show up, like, right there. But I don't have all that shit. Because this is what I'm dealing with. Ten-year-old computer. No camera. Yeah. Go check out that trailer. Looks funny. I wonder, what, is it, what does it say it's about? New animated series following a group of aliens who barely escaped the destruction of their home world. Suddenly they find themselves stranded on planet Earth which they discover is a human-infested crap hole <laughs> without a single redeeming value. Yeah, that sounds about right. Now all they can do is protect the Poopa, a living supercomputer that will terraform Earth once it evolves into its true form someday. That's funny. That's, that's, that should be funny. Moving on here, let's see what else. Eternals writers, so Marvel's the Eternals, their writers, are now working on the script for Mark Miller's Netflix film Prodigy. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know anything about this. It, it, it looks like it's a, it's a comic book. I don't know it, but I, I'm all for, like, more comic book adaptations. Netflix is moving forward with its film adaptation of Mark Miller's comic book series, Prodigy. Oh, I should have known. Mark Miller, he did... Come on, yo. Mark Miller's known for comics. Why am I blanking? I'll tell you why, because I've been in this fucking room for two weeks straight. Uh... And they've hired screenwriters Matthew Furpo and Ryan Furpo, who are writing the, who wrote the Eternals. They are also writing the screenplay for director Justin Kurzel. 
Oh, no. Okay. The Marvel Eternals writers are also writing the screenplay for director Justin Kurzel's Ruin, which Margot Robbie is set to star in. So those writers are, are building a career for themselves, no doubt. Prodigy follows a character named Edison Crane, the world's smartest man, who isn't content with running the world's most successful business. His brilliant mind needs constant challenge, and so he's become the go-to guy for governments around the world when a problem arises they just can't handle. A Nobel Prize winning scientist, a genius composer, an Olympic level athlete, and an expert in the in the occult. In the occult. Why am I having a hard time with words today? Again, it's because I've been in this fucking room two weeks. Edison Crane is as addicted to the mysteries of the world as he is to sitting at the top of the Fortune 500. Okay, that's that's cool. Mark Miller is known for, I mean, he's done Spider-Man comics, and it's definitely, uh, that's interesting. What else? Uh, this was cool. I talked about The Invisible Man last week. Well... Poster for the original Invisible Man, like a poster from the original film, sold for $180,000 at an auction this past week. <laughs> I'll put the, the poster up right here. That's, that's fucking crazy. But hey, that is a classic. I was thinking about buying all the like classic monster movies and like doing like a marathon. Got nothing else to do. I'm glad I get to do this podcast every week because it's like a moment to just just chill and talk about movies. It's like a nice it's a nice moment of the week that I, I get to do. It's relaxing and shit. I'd be more loose too if I didn't have to worry about shit fucking up. Like I don't know. I'm sitting here right now talking. I don't know if my phone, like if someone called me. I don't know. If if someone called me right now and the and the, the fucking video's just not recording. You, are you there? Are you, you, you getting this? Still? That happened two weeks in a row. Just stop fucking recording. Whatever. Hey, let's take a moment to uh, thank our sponsors. Oh yeah, that's right. I don't have it. <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, what's next? What else? Some good stuff this week. The Mandalorian. More news on that. Uh, so, uh, last season, Bill Burr, comedian Bill Burr, played a character called Mayfield in one of the episodes. It's been confirmed that character and Bill Burr will be returning for season two of The Mandalorian. Awesome. That was a really, really cool episode, too. Uh, also, they cast Aliens and Terminator star Michael Beal. Is it Beal? How do you pronounce his last name? Bean. Michael Bean. You know who I'm talking about if you're like a big fan. Of, if you know classic action films, like sci-fi films. So he, yeah, he was in Aliens, the sequel to Alien. He was in that and he played John Connor in the first Terminator movie. And if, and if you're a big fan of comedies, you'd seen, you would have seen him in Take Me Home Tonight. He plays the cop father of Topher Grace and Anna Faris in that. I don't know why that, that's just what I think of when I think of Michael Bean. All of a sudden, but yeah, that guy, he's, he's going to be in The Mandalorian. He's got a lot of sci-fi experience, so that's fucking cool. So that too. And then there's, uh, so, um, David Harbour, 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 Harp. I swear to God with the pronunciations today, David Harbour. Yeah, he said season four was supposed to come out in early 2021. That would have been... God, that's still such a long wait. But that, you know what? That might not be the case anymore. With delays and shit, it could be even longer. Early 2020? Oh, it's, yeah, early 2021. No, yeah, no, it'll be out in summer of 2021 now. Because of all this shit. You know, unless everything falls apart, you know. Apocalypse. Shit. In which case, we don't have to worry about how much money we're not making right now. You know? Um, got bigger things to worry about if that happens. 
Also, uh, Angry Birds animated series is is being ordered at Netflix. So they're doing an Angry Birds animated series at Netflix. I guess that's interesting. I don't know. And finally, I you know I mentioned the Mandalorian last week. Cast Rosario Dawson as Ahsoka Tano. Still the coolest thing I've heard recently. But now they're saying they're setting her up for her own spin-off live action series on Disney Plus. That is the latest rumor. We'll have to see where the Mandalorian takes her character and how it ties in with Clone Wars and Rebels and all that stuff. But for her to actually possibly have her own series live action is just more fanboy shit that I can't contain the hype about. Can't you tell? Look at how fucking ecstatic I am right now. <laughs> Alrighty. That's really all there was for news this week. I don't know. I don't know. Let's move on. Let's talk about Just Mercy. I watched it right here. Twice. Very, very moving fucking movie. Meaningful fucking movie. Which brings me to that powerful quote. Your life is still meaningful. Is like the big thing here. It's a line spoken by Brian Stevenson in the film. Played exceptionally by Michael B. Jordan. What's most fascinating about the line is that it has a deeper meaning. Okay, he says, your life is still meaningful. His life was always meaningful, is really what this story is about. This story becomes about more than just helping people. It becomes about saving lives. Let's talk about it. Spoilers ahead for anyone who didn't watch this yet. And I say spoilers for everything. I know spoilers is a term that derived from big blockbuster movies. Don't ruin fucking Avengers for me. But spoilers apply to anything. Because why ruin a plot? Why ruin a fucking plot for yourself? Turn the fucking podcast off right now if you haven't seen the movie. Okay? And then go watch the movie because you have time. Don't ruin... Don't be one of those people. I hate that sh I hate when fucking... I hate when all the fucking shit pops up of people trying to... Like, decipher fine shit. Like, in... You know, reveal shit before the movie's out. Like, oh, here, oh, look, I think we just plot leaked this movie and that movie. Fuck you. Stop trying to plot leak it. All right? Wait like everyone else. Go see it and be blown away by what you're surprised with. I mean, why do you want to ruin it for yourself? <sighs> that was a whole big thing with before season eight of Game of Thrones. People were trying to, like, leak the scripts and shit. Who are these people? Get out of here. Go jump off a fucking... Alright, let's talk about the movie. So, in terms of story and script, as I watched this film, it appeared to me that what's right and what's wrong is what the story is telling us. That's what it becomes about. Right and wrong. Making sure it's impressed upon people, not just the characters in the film, but us, too. It's important that we understand the magnitude of this story. As much as the characters are trying to express the magnitude of this situation to the terrible fucking people, the antagonists in this movie, they're trying to fucking... They have to make a point here that this is wrong to... And and it's important. My point is, it's important that audiences know that too. It's a, it's a rel very relevant film. Mercy is the theme at the forefront of this film, of course, um, and it comes in all the smallest little moments that build to the most merciful thing of all, which is freeing Johnny D, played magnificent magnificently by Jamie Fox. Ow! I just hit my tooth. Um, Right from the start, we see how scarce mercy is for black people in the South. In an opening scene, Brian meets with Henry, a death row inmate, 
And Brian just telling him that he's not at risk for execution that year brings tears to Henry's eyes, brings him relief, even if only for a short moment, as every day it's clear Henry fears for his life. Just telling him that was mercy. It's, I mean, that's fucking, it was, that's what he's going through, Henry. It's like relentless. And the slightest bit of good news comes as mercy. Uh, that 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 scene alone was like this is what we're the way the guard comes in and takes him away this is what we're this is what they're this is what they're dealing with in Alabama it becomes clear right then that for the most part it's mercy these death row men are looking for at the very least I mean for the love of God mercy please they deserve more than that they, as we as the we see as the movie unfolds, it's not it's not just about denying Johnny D. Uh, hold on. It's so they're so loud. They're so loud. Sirens. I hear about ten a day. Okay. And if I'm watching something, I definitely got to pause it while it goes by. I'm not trying to be like, obviously, they need to get where they got to go. It's, um, it's an emergency. But we're not deaf. <laughs> you can lower them a little bit. I don't know. Whatever. But, um, yeah, anyway, moving on. It also becomes clear that Brian acts as a symbol and energy of hope, okay, for these men. That mercy is possible. He acts as a symbol that mercy is a possibility. Um, Brian comes to see time and time again that there is no mercy, none at all, in this land, in Alabama, in 1989. Um, so him and everyone else have to fight for it, literally. It is literally like this place in Alabama is hell, okay? And if you know anything about hell, there is no mercy in hell. That's what it's like, seriously. For Brian to go into hell and fight for not just mercy, but more than that, fight for freedom for Johnny D, is a, is a fucking bold, courageous move. He literally puts himself in danger to achieve justice. To fight for freedom from hell, that becomes the story that we're watching. That's, become, that's the story that unfolds. Innocence is a common theme. Obviously, Johnny D is innocent. Um, and I think that's obvious, but the filmmakers play around with this thin line between innocence, okay? And what I mean by that is everyone makes mistakes, right? Everyone sins. They let us know Johnny D's sin. Johnny D's sin was that he cheated on his wife. Brian, uh, not so much a sin, but his failure with Herb, the character Herb, was in part due to getting involved at all. Not that it would have mattered. They were these men are pers persecuted from the second that they're fucking born. Um, Herb was gonna be put to death, but Brian might have speeded it, sped it along a little bit. So that's like part. That's like his his failure in the his big failure in the film was unable to was he was unable to save Herb's life. It's the reversal. That's the reversal of the film. Um, but the point is, not every mistake deserves severity of punishment. Not everyone should be killed for something they did. Obviously. Um, people never have the right to take your life away from you. It's, a, it's even a line in the film. Uh, Johnny D says it to her. He says, it doesn't give them the right to kill you back. And it's true. And to, to a certain extent, obviously, I'm, this, is a, this is clearly about black men being persecuted just for being black, but if there are, there are criminals in the world who, who perhaps deserve to, to be, yeah, deserve to be fucking killed, but it's a, it's an interesting question of who, who decide, who gets to decide that? What, who are we to decide whether or not someone should die for what they did? I personally, it's uh, when I hear stories though of things that people have done. I want nothing more than the same thing to be done to the person who did it. But it's just that's a lot of 
obvious anger and rage and anyone who loses somebody it <laughs> vengeance is like all they're thinking about it's hard to see it from another point of view but that's not even you know it's not even what this this story is it's not about that as much as it's about innocence because Johnny D is innocent he's an innocent man the only thing he's guilty of is being black He's the only thing is, is being a black man in Alabama. It's important that you know Johnny D. It's, it's, it's important that like, in the story that you know Johnny D cheated on his wife with a white woman. Because to the people of Alabama, him sleeping with a white woman is as bad as murder. Their prejudice condemned Johnny D to death the day he did that. That's fucked up. Um, Johnny D says it best. He says you're guilty from the moment you're born. He says that. In the movie. It becomes hard to watch sometimes too. It really does. There's some scenes that are tough, man. It's perhaps one of the more thought provoking films as of late that I've watched. Most most one of the most relevant. Um what I will get into here is that uh this this is a fight for freedom, plain and simple. Um it's a matter of right versus wrong, as I said. This isn't a story about a trial for murder. It's not what this is about. It's really a trial about right and wrong. Brian says over and over in the film he's just trying to help people. But I think a defining moment in the film is when Eva, played wondrously by Brie Larson. I, I love Brie Larson. She says, you get close to your clients, she says to Brian. And that's because they are people. There's there are people being murdered. It's still murder. Men on trial for being black. Is it's it's not a crime. Like he gets close to them because they're human beings and they they deserve human connection. That's the defi that's one of the defining moments in the film is when they talk about that. When she when she says that to Brian. He's not just helping people, as I said. He is saving lives. Um, structurally, this film has a reversal, like I said, but it also has one of those down-and-out moments. Now, if you know anything about writing, um, there's a down-and-out, rock-bottom moment in, in almost every film. If there isn't, it it's part of the reversal it's like the midpoint but sometimes there's a midpoint there's a reversal and then there's like a down and out like a complete like you lost like the hero lost or it seems that way and they have to literally do everything they can to pick themselves back up and find the will to, to continue on and, and actually win so this film has that it's usually at the end of act two sometimes it's not that and sometimes it's just a crisis moment at the beginning of Act 3 or at the middle of Act 3 that sparks them into the climax. But in, so like I said, is Herb's, Herb being murdered by the state. Then the down and out moment is when Brian loses with Ralph at the trial. When, when, when Johnny D is declined by the judge. And they have to literally reassess what to do next which brings them into the whole, bringing it to the Supreme Court and 60 Minutes. So that was, a, that was just something to point out structurally. They, they had one of those moments when it seems like they're, they lost. It's when, even after getting Ralph to admit the truth on the stand, that, that, that fucking judge with that fucking smirk on his face still declines. It, those, the people were fucking, oh my God, man, I wanted to punch that judge <laughs> in that scene. That was so fucking bad. All right, what else did I really like about this one? I know that I always like try to find the. Here's the thing: you, I don't shit on movies as much as I find what I liked about them. You'll notice I didn't. I don't really like. Just. I don't. I don't. I'm not negative, with movies. So if that's what you're coming here, to see is me rip on a movie. I, I gotta get some. I gotta get another perspective. I need like a, a co-host who hates movies more than he. It would be good to have the argument. 
All right, let's just get some guests, because I... There are plenty of people I know who would love to just shit on movies for no reason. And then I'd really love to... I'd love to have those people in here, because if you're going to shit on something, at least intelligently break down why you didn't like it. I'm intelligently breaking down why I liked it. I hate when people like are just like, oh, that movie sucked. Why? <laughs> tell me why. <laughs> so many and, and when I ask that question, people don't tell me why. They just they're like, I just didn't like it. Or, like it's like I don't know, whatever. In terms of direction, I picked up on the symbolic reasoning behind the opening moments. The way it's shot. We see a couple of things. The opening image itself is a swinging rope, okay? Clearly, clearly it was for work for Johnny D. He's a, he's a lumberman. But it's meant to represent or symbolize the rope of death, or even more than that, it's meant to like symbolize an, a lynching that is about to take place for him. It's literally like a lynching. Um, then, then there's the trees and the sky. Johnny D looks at them and then later thinks of them. We see that same shot twice in the film. For Johnny D, his job is one of many elements that he enjoys about his life. It signifies a peacefulness, but I think more importantly, it, represent, it represents freedom, fresh air, you know, takes, he, takes in it, he takes in the fresh air in that moment. He looks at the sky, at the trees, and unfortunately, that opening moment where he looks up at the sky is the last look he gets before that freedom is taken away from him. That moment goes on to act as a peacefulness he can think of and escape to when he's incarcerated, hoping to see it again. So visually, that was the defining moment that stood out to me, visually. Performance-wise, although all the performances were good, um, in the film, it was Jamie Foxx all the way in this one. Jamie Foxx playing Johnny D steals the show. He was fantastic. I, I love Michael B. Jordan, and he did great. I'm just saying that for me, it was Jamie Foxx. It was the best, my favorite performance in the film. I'm sure the real Brian Stevenson would agree too, honestly. I don't know, maybe not. I'm sure he enjoyed watching Michael B. Jordan play him, but Jamie Foxx had the most impactful of the performances. Quick mention. Uh, I found it interesting that director Daniel Destin Creighton made a point of linking the parallel between this story and the one in To Kill a Mockingbird. The fact that this was a true story means these kinds of things were all brought up, but it's important that it's referenced a certain way in the film. So I'm, I'm assuming that when Brian Stevenson in real life actually went there. People were, I don't know, maybe not. It's based on a book. This is based on Brian Stevenson's book, so maybe it, it is brought up in the book uh, that people were always mentioning to him about To Kill a Mockingbird and stuff. Um, but it's I'm, all I'm saying is that it's important in the movie that this is brought up at certain points. Uh, little things like this. Uh, you know... Um, the white people of this town are constantly bringing up to Brian that To Kill a Mockingbird is like their, their, their historical like social justice landmark thing. They keep Everybody keeps bringing it up to him. It's like their fun fact about the town. Which I, the way I took it was it, they wouldn't even be bringing it up if Brian was like a white guy coming in and talking to him. The fact that he's a black man is why they're bringing it up. It's just so snarky. It's fucking... Um, but they keep bringing it up to him as if they forgot what that whole story was about. What's To Kill a Mockingbird about? It's very similar to what's going on here. They have this, like, a similar thing taking place right before their eyes, and they're, like, completely ignorant about it. They keep bringing it up to him, and it's like, it's like they're just trying to be dicks about it or something. That, I also thought it was interesting, I don't know if I heard this wrong, but the, the judge's name is Robert E. Leakberg. Robert E. Lee Berg. Could it sound more like Robert E. Lee? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't have to tell you what a racist fucker that guy was. Anyway, moving on. My overall take on this is as simple as having this film exist at all. 
okay? It's one of those films that just needs to be made. Um, a story that needs to be told, and the fact that it is a true story, I think it goes without saying how relevant this film is, even for now, because we have these problems. We don't have... Uh, I don't know if it's as bad as this was, but think about it. This happened in 1989. That is not that long ago. For crying out loud, that's fucking insane. This is pretty recent, and it's fucked up how bad it really was. I mean, it might even still be that bad in Alabama right now. I don't know. I'm glad I don't live there. Fucking... A fucking shithole. Sorry. Alabama, but I don't know. Maybe you're not a shithole anymore. But maybe you are. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but I know that uh, that's this, that's why this story needed to be told. The fact that it happened this recently, alone. And I know Brian Stevenson, he went on to continue saving lives well after Johnny D. He shed a light on this, this problem. This uh, death row inmate problem. The humanizing themes shine through in this film. It couldn't be more relevant, as I said. Things like freedom, hope, peace, innocence, and of course, mercy is the main theme. Mercy being the main theme, of course, with the title. And uh, the fact that the story feels like a continuous infliction of pain and suffering on our main characters. You are watching it also begging for mercy. You watching it like, Jesus Christ... Mercy. Um, when does it end? <laughs> You're like, uh, even that moment after the retrial is declined, you see everything that came before taking its toll on the characters. They're totally broken. Like I said, that is the down and out moment. They, they are suffering at that point. And it's further heightened too by the music that's playing during the sequence, like the, in the background, the, the lyrics of the song are no more, no more. Like, because, yeah, for crying out loud, please. No more pain, no more suffering. Mercy. Um, and you ask yourself, you're like, how does this end? How does, how does it end? And it ends with, with fighting. They have to fight. It is a fucking, it becomes a war. It becomes a battle. Uh, it's, it's a simple matter of right and wrong. The word right is thrown around a lot by the characters. Brian's saying to Ralph at one point, he says, this is your last chance to make things right. Or he says to Chapman when he visit, visits him at his house, he says, I think deep down you know what's right. And when you believe in something, you have to fight to stop those who continuously oppose what you are trying to do. It does become one hell of a fight, too. And Brian needs to win in order to save Johnny D's life. There's this connection, too, uh, between fighting this battle and then war itself, which I really liked. Um, I liked the connection between Johnny D and Herb. Herb was an actual soldier. He fought in Vietnam. He fought in the Vietnam War, and uh, because of this, the trauma he suffered, he was never the same again. And uh, that trauma weighed on him mentally all the way till the end. That kind of experience is connected with the war of discrimination, okay, playing out here. Even going as far as pointing out that this battle is more hopeless than fighting an actual war in Vietnam. Herb says... Right before his death, he says to Brian, he says, at least in Nam, I had a chance. This continues to be a parallel when it's revealed that Johnny D, at the end of the film, it's revealed that the real Johnny D struggled with his trauma for the rest of his life. From what he went through and all of all this that he went through, he suffered from dementia, mentally struggling with this all the way until he died. I mean, that if that's not PTSD, I don't know what is. So the connection between actual war and then this war for freedom um, and war against discrimination. I, I like that parallel. Johnny D is having a hard time mentally maintaining himself throughout the film. When he's talking to Herb to try and calm him down, it's also like he's talking to himself. I love that, that moment in the film. That's also when we see that shot again. When we see that shot uh, of the trees and the skies from the beginning, it's... it's um, Johnny D reassuring himself too and holding and trying to be hopeful and hold on to that that one image of freedom that he's trying to get back. Uh, 
and he's having a hard he has a hard time holding on to hope in this movie. That's like the big main first thing, and it becomes like a like a recurring theme of the movie. Um, so what do you do when you're fighting a war? You do whatever it takes to win. Brian being a black man with with a determination to come into Alabama and save these men from death proves to be an extreme challenge. Uh, Darnell says to him at one point, he's like, I can't fight these guys, right? But Brian can. That's why he's here. And even though it's difficult, um, he can beat them because he's smarter than them, okay? And it's... His whole Harvard persona is thrown around as a joke or as an insult, but it's true. He beats them because he's smarter than they are. Um... I mean, t- dumbass Sheriff Tate leaves his initial recordings with Ralph Myers lying around for Brian to find. He's a dumbass. Fucking. I mean, that guy was so. It was cringeworthy listening to him speak sometimes. Or all the whole time. He was a fucking asshole. Um. And when it seems like they lost, right, I mentioned the end, the down and out moment with Ralph, and, uh, and the, when it seems like they lost the trial, it's Brian and his intelligence again that takes it to the next level in order to beat them. When he goes, he does the 60 minutes thing, which was brilliant, and the Supreme Court takes it to the Supreme Court. It's a brutal fight, and we come to see that Brian's presence has an impact. Slowly, we see change start to happen. This is what was so great, too. Um, change specifically is thrown, uh, is shown through the prejudice, white folk, he has an impact on. Uh, I, I, I kind of just started, like, they, they were all just, they're all fucking ignorant and shit, but they slowly, like, start, slow, very slowly start to, like, shift a couple of people. So I think it starts with the prison, the young prison guard who, makes Brian strip in the beginning, which was just fucking humiliating. Terrible. But that... That character of the, of the prison guard, who I think, first of all, I think he represents a biased upbringing, as if he doesn't know anything else except what he's been taught to hate his whole life. Because he is a character who, like, slowly changes throughout the film. He... We see him shift in personality. He lets Johnny D meet with his family at one point... He, he does not handle Herb's death well. It doesn't seem like he was, was expecting that. Um, he also gives Johnny D the pictures of his family. He starts to soften a little bit. I think it's just... It, to take it a step further, there's Ralph Myers, too, who Brian eventually gets him to recant his whole statement on the stand. And... Uh, so there's there's Ralph too. Um, I think turning shifting him was important, but then the biggest thing of all that Brian does obviously is his he impacts Chapman enough to make Chapman back off. He gets under Chapman. He gets in there and he makes Chapman realize that this it is wrong what's going on. At a, eventually, it, it finally happens. Chapman allows Johnny D to have his freedom. So I think it, the point of the, what I'm saying here is that. Brian's impact on these people in Alabama actually is it it shines through. Like we see that he starts to have an impact and change people's minds, make them understand that what they're doing is wrong. Not everybody, obviously, but enough of an impact where he does what he's what he does what he's came there to do, and he saves he saves Johnny D. I mean, uh, I mean, that's it, really. Uh, yeah. Like I said, it's about right versus wrong, good versus bad. And it's about fighting the bad. Anyone fighting, too, is taking risks. Uh, the One of the hardest scenes to watch is when Brian is pulled over and that... That was really fucked up when he's um, pulled pulled out of the car at gunpoint. That that was just that is what they're dealing with. Anyone fighting is 
is putting themselves at risk. Even Eva has to put her, she's putting her family safety at risk by helping Brian. Um, Brian having to risk being injured or killed? They don't make it easy. I think the biggest thing of all to take away from this is that hope, like I said, okay, hope is what it comes down to. They can't lose hope. Johnny D has completely lost hope when we first meet him, right? Brian has to help him find it again, and in doing so, reclaim his identity. The one thing they truly took away from him. He has to find himself, find his truth, as he puts it at the end. He says, help me find my truth again. Which is why the final, some of the final words of the film, Brian says in voiceover, I now know that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. Could not be more true. If Johnny D didn't even allow Brian to try and help him because of hopelessness in the beginning, it, it, it wouldn't have went the way it did. Hopelessness would have beaten justice. Johnny D wouldn't have been saved. So the main thing that we all can take away from it too, besides understanding what's right and wrong, is that we can't lose hope. Can't ever lose hope. Wow, okay. I think I made it all the way through an episode without a problem for once. I'm hoping I could go over to my phone right now and it could not be recording and, you know, my whole Sunday can just go fuck itself. I hope it should be recorded. I hope it is. Um, overall... The only reason I didn't... Alright, so it wasn't a great film only because... It's not... It's not new in... How do I put this? It's not something I haven't... I've seen films like it. I don't know. I just... It was good. It was very good. I gave it an 8.4. 8.4 out of 10... Good movie. I recommend it. Watch it. It's it's on. Uh, it's on, it's streaming now. It's on Apple. I wonder how else can you find it. That's probably the only place it's available. Anywhere I guess it's I get, anywhere that it's streaming and you, Amazon probably too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, good movie. Go watch it. And that is it. That is it. Let's do our sci-fi quote of the week. I think in light of everything that's going on, this is actually a pretty good one. I like this. Let's see if you can tell me what this is from. The quote is, What is the most resilient parasite? Bacteria? A virus? An intestinal worm? Name that movie. And if you can't tell me what that is, come on. I even said it in the same way he says it in the movie. Tell me what that movie is. And to take it a step further, tell me who is saying it in the movie. All right. Any trailers come out this week? No? I already mentioned Solar Opposites. Nothing big in terms of trailers. I love when the big stuff comes. Marvel trailer, Star Wars, something. Nothing like that. So that's it. Uh, as usual, follow the show on uh, at Screen Preach on Instagram. Follow me on Twitter at the Ben Morganti. Also, if you want to follow me personally on Instagram, also the Ben Morganti. Uh, check out my website. A ben and uh, you can find this show on Apple Podcasts and YouTube at Morganti Studios or just by typing in Screen Preach it should come up if you want to truly support the show become a patron at Patreon uh, I think you gotta search my name Ben Morganti at Patreon to become a patron Matt is going to do it.
Yeah, see, look at that. I put them up on the screen this time. How do you like that? There they are. <laughs> All right, that's it, people. This is good. This is a good one. I like this one. Come back next week where I will be talking about Birds of Prey, latest DC film. I'll get into it. I'm going to get into the whole thing with DC and everything. It's a good, uh, I like, I'm looking forward to that one. So come back and as usual, be safe. Hopefully all we all get through this soon and have a cinematic week.